Hey, this is a special interview with Anthony Del Cole about his uh, his digital uh, Marvel series, Luke Cage, Everyman, which sees the hero of Harlem face a new threat both from outside and within. Um, mild spoilers, although I guess it's in the kind of in the solicit info. But yeah, if you're looking to go into this uh, miniseries completely blind, we do go into some plot points, though we actually keep it pretty spoiler light. But uh, you know. Yeah, this is Anthony's second time, and it's cool to see him get a get a Marvel book, man. And yeah, th- let's, without much further ado, here's Anthony Del Cole. And coming back on the show is Anthony Del Cole. He's uh, doing the uh, the uh, Marvel digital first uh, comic book series, Luke Cage Everyman, which you can get on Comixology and uh, through uh, you know through Comixology Unlimited or through uh, Marvel Unlimited and all that good stuff. Anthony, thanks again for uh, coming on the show. I'm really glad to be back. So, Luke Cage, you know, first off, like, how, how what was it about, because you, you had done a bunch of historical, you know, we, the last time you were on, we were talking about Son of Hitler, of course, you had done the Assassin's Creed tie-in uh, comic books, you had done, um, you know, you had done the uh, Nancy Drew, um, Hardy Boys crossover, what was it about Luke Cage, where you were just like, oh yeah, this is, of all the Marvel Universe, this is the one? <laughs> Well, in this case, I will admit this was this was one where Marvel came to me. Um, they were huge fans of what I had done with, especially Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys, and with Kill Shakespeare and everything. Um, and they really wanted to come, um, and they wanted to do like a, a good mystery with Luke Cage. So, based on Nancy Drew Hardy Boys, The Big Lie, I was approached. I was approached by Marvel, and they asked if I'd be interested. And of course, my immediate reaction was, "Hell yeah, let's do this." <laughs> Um, just because, I mean, Luke Cage has always been a really interesting character. He's also, he's, it just worked out. He's, he's, he's always been one of my favorites just because, you know, a lot of superheroes are larger-than-life characters. They have all these amazing superpowers. Luke, to me, is that sort of character where he just, he has, yes, he has his um, unbreakable skin, but at, at its core, he's, he's a family man. Like, he's a husband. Uh, he's a father. He wants to help out the community, and to me, that's always been really appealing. So, like I said, as soon as they came to me with their with you know asking if I'd be interested in pitching a story, the answer was hell yeah. Where did the idea for um, Luke Cage to suffer you know CTE kind of come about? Wow! Wow! Spoiler alert! Right there, huh? Oh, oh, yeah, <laughs> right at the beginning of the show. No, I'm just kidding. It's fine. Um, no, I mean uh, very early on. It's uh, in the first issue that we find out that he is diagnosed with CT. Um, I mean, it, when Marvel came to me and asked if I wanted to do a pitch, uh, and I said hell yeah, of course. Um, I started to think about well, okay, well, what would the story be? And I thought about Luke and you know his skills, his fears, and that sort of thing. And to me, what was really interesting was here's a man who. Is physically un, you know un, un, uh, unbeatable. Like no one can stop him physically. But what about inside? And so I started to think about okay, well, you know, if there was a, some sort of internal malady, some sort of internal problem, what could that be? And I had already done some some reading and some research into CTE. I just find it really interesting. I mean. It, obviously, it's a very controversial topic. Uh, there are a lot of people that you know the evidence, all the scientific evidence points to yes, this exists, and yet you have NFL owners and football fans who are like, "Nah, that's made up. It's not. It's not a real thing." So it's controversial, and so I, you know, I've sort of been fascinated by. It. And then when I was just thinking about, you know, what could the biggest obstacle be for Luke Cage, uh, and something that internal, it just kind of came to me. It's like, oh, what if it was CTE? Uh, and it gave me a great opportunity to start to explore it even further. Spoke to some, you know, spoke to a, a Stanford researcher about it, and yeah, it just seemed the perfect fit for Luke Cage. That, you know, the the thing he's scared about the most is not being able to be there for his family and for his his neighborhood, his community, and CTE can bring all of that. Right, kind of this idea that. I mean, that's that's the character shtick, or it had been for like decades, right? He's like an indestructible character, and you've kind of highlighted this. You've highlighted this vulnerability, this very real world, very kind of pressing vulnerability. Pressing? Prescient? Prescient. That's the one. Prescient? We'll just go with prescient. Prescient, <laughs> yeah. P words. The, um, prescient. Uh, P-R-E-S-C-I-E-N-T. <laughs> yeah. Solve the, you've solved the puzzle, Pat. But the, <laughs> <laughs> um, with, uh, you know, with, with this sort of thing, and in, in, it, it makes... It, in a way, it kind of makes Luke also like an unreliable narrator in his own story, right? 
because he can't trust his own mind. He can't trust his own body. Like everything is kind of, it's, it's the hero of Harlem. It's the, it's the indestructible Marvel character kind of like pitted against himself. And I think it's an interesting kind of revisionist take that, I mean, I'm trying to think if there's any, if there's any kind of like hero where that's, at least in the Marvel universe where that's really kind of come about. Well, I mean, they're in the Marvel universe. I mean, you have had characters who have started to go, you know, have, <clears throat> pardon me, been attacked by mental conditions or at least are going through mental conditions. I mean, right off the top of my head, there's one of the classic Frank Miller Daredevil epi- um, uh, issues where, I mean, he's, starting, he's, he's being driven uh, insane uh, by Kingpin. Uh, I, God, I can't remember exactly which issue number that is. Um, but, I mean, it's been done before, but, I mean, nothing to the extent where, you know, it's something that's so, I guess, you know, oppressing, as you say, or something is relevant today. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think you identified perfectly, and that's what really intrigued me is, I mean, he becomes his own unreliable narrator. He's, you know, he doesn't know if he can trust himself. In the very first issue, he forgets his daughter's name temporarily. You know, I mean, he starts to, you know, he he, he takes rash actions, and these are all things that happen when you have CT, um, you know, as, as it goes on and on. And because it's Luke Cage, I mean, these, these symptoms start to come up, you know, a lot quicker than they normally would be. Um, and yeah, I mean, and that's, you know, I, mean, I think that's a fear for everybody. I mean, uh, I, knock on wood, have never had a family member that has suffered from in, um, uh, Alzheimer's. Um, but I know friends who have. And it's a horrible, horrible disease where you can't even remember anything. In this case, where you can't even trust anything that you're doing, mm-hmm. that makes it, you know, just as bad. Without necessarily giving the game away, will we start to, you know, the series certainly starts in the heart of Harlem. We see we see Luke with Danielle. Are we going to see more of Luke Cage's kind of, like, traditional supporting cast kind of join him as he deals with this new, with this new, uh, this new ailment? Uh, again, I don't want to have any, I don't want to re- reveal any spoilers, but yes, I think you're probably alluding to at least one specific character that will show up. Uh, and yes, that character does appear. Uh, because I mean, again, what's most intriguing to me in the story, I mean, in addition to, I mean, and I, I apologize. One of the things I probably should say is that this story is not just about Luke and CT. I mean, we have Luke. It's the middle of the worst heat wave in Harlem history, and he's tracking down a serial killer who, who calls himself the Everyman. And so while in the midst of doing this uh, and with the city starting to go deliriously either interested or mad uh, with all the stuff that's happening. Uh, I mean, Luke is faced with the CT challenge. But yes, you know, one of the, to me, the most intriguing thing about writing this series is, I mean, I love the action. We have a really, really great villain that's going to appear. Uh, we have, uh, you know, villains already appeared, someone that's helping out the main, you know, the everyman. Um, but to me, the most interesting things are the emotional moments. So really between Luke and his daughter, Danielle, you know, and questioning himself as a father, will I be able to be here for her moving forward? Um, and also him with his friends or with his family, and they will, you know, they will make appearances over the course of the next few issues. You you had mentioned, um, you know, being a, a Luke Cage fan, and you, of course, mentioned, you know, the iconic, like, born-again Daredevil story. As ah, a, that's what it was. Ah. I don't know what the issue numbers are. It's like 280 to like, I don't remember how many parts it was. I feel like it was an eight issue story. It's either way, you know, specifics aside, were you always kind of more drawn to the more street level superheroes? Yeah, I always have been. I mean, from the very beginning, I mean, the very first, one of the very first comics I read was, uh, was Batman. And so that's immediately, he was one of my favorites in the Marvel universe daredevil has always been one of my favorites luke cage yeah again just because for me and i guess for a lot of readers they're they're more relatable i mean these are people that have yes they they do have superpowers or they have amazing extraordinary abilities but they're not beyond you know they're not it's not thor where i mean there's an entire world that's devoted to him and all these superpowers i mean for luke yeah i mean it's just He's a guy who just wants to help his help his community out, and at the end of the day, go home and spend some time with his wife and his family. And to me, that's it's a very you know it's very relatable as someone growing up in northern Canada. So, yeah, I really you know that's that's why I was really excited when they uh, when they asked me to pitch on the series. And speaking of which, you've got like you know growing up from being from northern Canada, you've got uh, Janoy Lindsay on, on art, you've got a uh, you and uh, Ian Herring on 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 colors, you've got a full Canadian like compliment 
How did that all, did you like put the A-team together or was that something that Marvel was like, hey, we got these guys, would you be interested in tackling the hero of Harlem? Uh, I asked them to bring in the Alpha Flight team and since they couldn't bring them in, then they brought you know, in. in. Um, no, it just kind of worked out that way. Uh, I mean, I was the first one on board. I had put together the pitch. I think I'd already written the first issue. Uh, and then uh, the editorial team at Marvel, uh, namely Jake, Mark, and Alana, they had actually said, hey, you know, we're really thinking about bringing on G- uh, um, Genoa. And to be honest, I, had ne- I wasn't aware of his work, uh, but they sent me what he had done with She-Hulk. And Genoa is a – he's super talented. He's young. He's still young. This is only really the second title he's done of any comic series. Um, and he's so good. And as soon as I saw his work, I thought he'd be perfect for it. And yes, he's Canadian, which which helps out. And then, of course, the third member of the team, Ian, who has you know an exclusive deal for coloring with Marvel. He's done a bunch of stuff, and they brought him. You know, they suggested him because we really want to capture the the feeling or the vibe of this heat wave. Like it's hot. It's really, really hot, and it's driving everyone crazy. We, he just, um, Jake and Alana really knew that Ian would be able to capture those sort of tones or those sort of hues, so a lot of browns, a lot of yellows, a lot of oranges, uh, and he's done an amazing job. And so, yeah, it just it worked out. It's three Canadians that are, you know, uh, creating a story for the, um, the hero for hire in Harlem. Yeah, I was just kind of like, you know, thinking – New York heat waves are just the freaking worst. <laughs> like there, like there's something about. I'm going through it right now. Absolutely. Yeah, there's something about the idea that it just like brings out the worst in like everybody. The subway is terrible. This like you can practically you have trouble seeing clearly through the streets of like Manhattan or whatever because it's just so like humid and hazy. And so yeah, it's like you're bringing Luke to his lowest point at like the worst time of the year. Like it's like all the all the really like crappy stars, all the really shitty stars are like aligning at once against Luke. <laughs> as a as a creator, I'm also I'm I, I'm also torture, I guess you could say. Um, and I mean, really, as any creator, you really want to create that. Like, what is the worst possible thing that that can happen, and at the worst possible time. Uh, and I mean, yeah, you're, that, that's what you want to do. I mean, and we're, we're vindictive that way, I guess you, you could say, but that what's, but that's what leads to really interesting characters and interesting stories. Uh, and yeah, God, uh, my wife and I have now lived in New York for four and a half years and these summers are the worst. I mean, it, it's so hot outside. It's so hot on the subway platforms. That's the worst. And you ju- it makes us edgy. It makes us irritant. Um, it's, it's the worst. And so, uh, when they asked, you know, asked me to come up with a story, one of my first thoughts was, yeah, like let's set it, let's set it in Harlem and let's set it, you know, in the middle of this sort of heat wave. And I will admit I have been inspired by some of Spike Lee's movies. I mean, do the right thing and summer of Sam are two huge influences on it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it just, it compounds everything. This is a bit of a left field question, but have you seen black Klansman yet? I have not. Oh man, I'm. That's the next film I'm going to see. I'm so excited about it. Uh, I hope Spike Lee is back. From everything that I've read, it sounds like it, um, because when he can find us the right subject matter and the right creative team around him in terms of writers and producers, he's one of the best filmmakers that that's out there. Oh, exactly. um, and I mean, I know he was heavily. Insp- I mean, not in terms of the actual conception of the idea, but some. Um, he was influenced in terms. And some of the stuff he put into the film by Charles by the Charlottesville riots for, uh, last year, uh, and similarly, that was the exact same thing with Son of Hitler, the graphic novel that recently came out out of mind with um, Image Comics, where you know our ending was also inspired by Charlottesville. So that's why I'm phenomenally looking forward to seeing it. Yeah, I remember you guys mentioned that you had kind of rewritten that ending extensively and reworked that ending to more. I don't want to say like to, to more reflect the the times that we that we had kind of found ourselves in because, and if we're talking about prescience and relevance, I mean, is that always something that you strive for both, you know, here with the CTE with Luke and of course the, I mean, you had mentioned son of Hitler was around before the, the rise of, you know, popular, you know, alt-right populism, but it was that, do you always kind of try to find those, those nuggets of relevancy as you, as you write? I think any storyteller needs to, I mean, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, even historical fiction, and we we started off by talking about the fact that I've done a lot of historical fiction, um, and I mean, in, in in that sort of genre, you can tell metaphorical stories. Um, I mean, Son of Hitler talks about the rise of the alt right, as you say, white white supremacists, and that sort of thing. Uh, the Crucible is a metaphor. You know, uh, Crucible is a metaphor for McCarthyism in the fifties. So I mean, you can do that sort of thing. It's important for any artist to make it relevant, um, whether it's through the actions of a character. Uh, a story point, you know, the, the concept itself. So, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely trying to latch into these things that, you know, will, will make people intrigued. And in the case of Luke Cage, Everyman, I mean, like you, like I said, there are some people that don't believe in CTE or have no idea what it is. And one of the biggest things, and I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that it's for, it's football players. It's people that are play too many football games and get involved in tackles and concussions. But it's not just limited to football players. It's anyone that have... Um, that, that's in a line of work that um, involves a lot of impact. And when I say line of work, a lot of it is soldiers and veterans. And mm-hmm. these are people that are off fighting overseas and, you know, there are explosions nearby or whatever else it is. And they come back home and there's PTSD, but there's also CTE. And it's, it's a brutal, brutal disease, uh, brutal syndrome. And um, again, I mean, if I can kind of shed some insight into it and make people a little, a little more aware of it without being preachy, and you kind of have to find that fine line between, you know, hitting the audience over the head. And that's what's, uh, you know, we were just talking about Spike Lee. That's what I think he does in some of his films. Uh, so you have to, you want to avoid that, but you want to educate people doing it. So there's, there's a fine line between the two. Yeah. And, you know, to our readers at home, the, uh, I think you do find that crackerjack balance without going into too much detail. There is a certain supervillain that maybe appears in the second chapter, um, which I think, I don't know if that supervillain has ever faced Luke Cage before. Um, but the, without again, giving away his or her identity, uh, I'm just dancing between the the story raindrops, you know, this is going to be collected in trade later this year. I was wondering how many chapters is every man going to run? Um, it's six. Well, it's technically it's six issues. So, I mean, I was contract for six issues. Now what, um, Marvel is doing with this, uh, digital only release is that they're putting two chapters or two issues in at a time. So chapter one is technically issue uh, one and two. Chapter two, which will come out in mid-September, will be cha- uh, issues uh, three and four. Uh, and then chapter three will be five and six. And then that uh, those six issues or three chapters will be collected uh, uh, into a volume, which I think is slated for mid-November. Is that- uh, it's, a really, it's, it's a really intriguing release, um, release strategy um, because, I mean, you guys know this. I mean, the industry is changing there. It seems as though there are few and fewer people people purchasing individual issues or floppies. You know, a lot of people are switching over to trade paperbacks. Uh, comic book shops are really hurting and it just costs a lot of money. So it's, you know, I, I miss the fact that I'm not, these that they're not coming out as individual issues at comic stores, but I applaud Marvel to try some new things. And from what I've been told, it's been a huge success thus far with Jessica Jones and with uh, with my Luke Cage series. Yeah, I mean, it's weird. They're the 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 Marvel New York power couple is kind of leading the charge into the into the uh, into the digital future. And I, you know, I, I suppose a part of that has to do with like Netflix. I, I wonder if we'll see a, a, a an Iron Fist digital first series next because you know the '70s was one of my for me. It's like the last major creative boon for Marvel. I, I love stuff that comes in the 80s too, but like in the 70s you had Luke Cage, you had Iron Fist, you had Shang-Chi, like Daredevil becomes Daredevil, the Punisher shows up. Um, there's just some, like this kind of like, almost like Grindhouse era for Marvel. Ghost Rider is created in the 70s. Mm-hmm. Um, at least the Ghost Rider that we all like know. Johnny. Yeah, that's the one. Not not Phantom Rider, the weird like ghost. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Like actual ghosts. <laughs> An not, actual ghost guess, on a horse. I guess Flaming Skull Motorcycle Rider didn't make, didn't sound as cool. Not in 1967, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. They hadn't seen Easy Rider yet. They didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, you're, you're kind of like, this is, you've got one of my, one of my favorite characters, but this book has made me suddenly like relook at all those covers of Luke Cage, like headbutting through like brick walls with a completely different light, you know? <laughs> Um, I'm glad it has, and I I I'd never thought I never thought of uh, the '70s Marvel as a grindhouse a grindhouse feel. But you are absolutely right on that. I think that's a really insightful observation. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the the industry is definitely changing, and I think by um, by having more, if you know, if they continue to do this, if you have more series that come out as digital only, 
again, one of the things about that is that it, it uh, reduces the costs because it costs money to, to print uh, and to ship it out to comic stores. But if you can put, you know, d- just with a few buttons, you just, you know, uh, you release it out into the world, I think it saves a lot of money. And I think it will lead to some more interesting and perhaps more niche stories. Uh, and therefore more interesting, like, you know, there might be more interesting characters that are that are created uh, out of this. Um, you know, there's a smaller barrier to, uh, to entry, I guess you could say, in terms of the mar- uh, in terms of that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's a very intriguing. I am just as someone who has only been in the comics industry for oh my god, it has been ten years already. Um, I am really intrigued with just new new uh, not only distribution models but also just new ways of storytelling. And to me, digital comics are just at the beginning of where they can be. Uh, I mean, because right now, digital comics are still just panel by panel. You, you swipe left, you know, swipe left, right? Um, you swipe left, and you go from one panel to the next panel, that sort of thing. But to me, when you think about it, if everything's up in the cloud anyway, why can't we have more interactive comics? Why can't we do you know, choose your own adventure, or you know, like you decide which 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 uh, path the, the character takes? Because, I mean, it's all going to be there. You just have the artist do two issues. Uh, and as we know from a Choose Your Own Adventure book from back, from back when we were young, we would end up, and we wouldn't just read for one story. We'd read the multiple different narratives and the different endings of it. So, I mean, to me, I would love to see that. But, I mean, that even that, it costs money to create the infrastructure for it and to do even more artwork per issue. I remember there was a Deadpool Choose Your Own Adventure comic Um a, a digital mi- comic or like an actual physical? I feel like it. W- I don't. I feel. I, it definitely was eventually physical, or maybe mm. when I say definitely, I'm speaking in the hyperbole and just pulling that out of my ass. But like, it definitely exists. I remember the. Uh, <laughs> I remember the musical co- issue where it gave you the song to listen to, and you read the dialogue in the. Well, melody. so did uh, China Clugston Flores is like uh, Blue Monday, right? Mm-hmm. That had the playlist as you mm-hmm. were going oh. through. Um, and you know, you're speaking of like changing models. I'm seeing like, you know, we do a lot of work with the image. A lot of those series are starting to go just trade only. They're like, all right, no more, no more floppies. It's like, oh, okay. Like as I'm watching, like, cause book sales, you know, book fairs are a huge thing now. Like it's always interesting. Has that affected, you know, writing this digital first with this unique kind of release model, like two issues at a go. Is that kind of, has that altered your storytelling pacing at all? Um, for Luke Cage, it wasn't until I think the, I was, I think I was already done the fourth issue when I was told that, oh, we're going to release them two issues at a time. So I didn't even know that. Um, so no, it didn't affect the story, uh, the writing process at all with respect to the, the chapter pattern. Um, however, ha- with the knowledge that it was going to be released di- digitally exclusively, um, the only major change was that I try to avoid doing any crazy like two page spreads Um, because with most series what I try to do is like every issue I always try to do one or two like really cool splash pages or like a two page spread where you have all these different things happening and I knew that when it comes to digital it makes it a little more difficult to publish it but more importantly to make it an enjoyable experience Um, and so I, I kind of I tried to reduce the amount that I was that I did of that. However, having said that, in issue number three, there's a one-page spread that has multiple uh, moments of action for Luke as he barrels into a building to try to track down the Everyman. Um, so, I mean, but for the most part, I mean, I kind of I kind of wrote as I normally as I as I would write anything else, whether it's graphic novel or individual issues of a comic series. That's right, because Son of Hitler was just like a one and done, like solid, concentrated dose of like Nazi fights, which is cool. <laughs> which is that always was cool. yeah. I mean, because originally when we pitched it to Image, um, we had pitched it as I think a ten issue series, and it was Eric Stevenson who was the editor, in, or you know, as is uh, you know, is the editor in chief there, uh, um, who actually had said that. Well, you know what? I think it might actually work better as a graphic novel, both in terms of story as well as from from a marketing perspective. Because he was afraid that, I mean, for those that don't know what Son of Hitler is, it's a World War II thriller about a young um, female spy handler in the UK who finds, discovers the legend that Hitler had fathered a child. During the First World War, she tracks down the son uh, who's in his mid-20s in occupied France and convinces him to assassinate his father. Um, and so with a title like Son of Hitler, Eric was afraid that people would hear that and if they read it, 
issue by issue that at some point we would make Nazi sympathetic or Hitler himself sympathetic. Uh, but if we put it, if we release it all in one fell swoop, then people could read it and go, no, actually, that's not the case. It's actually an intelligent, you know, espionage thriller. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, but I mean, there, I do really enjoy the process of writing serialized writing with where every issue comes out per month. There's just something, um, that makes it more intriguing. I enjoy playing the cliffhangers. I love the, you know, that final page reveal for every single issue that's going to make people excited to read the next one. Um, and I mean, to me, that's, it's almost a, like it is a very pure sense of storytelling. I mean, it goes all the way back to Dickens and uh, even um, uh, Sherlock Holmes. I mean, the Sherlock Holmes ended with an actual literal cliffhanger as Sherlock Holmes was about to die on the cliffs of Reichenbach. Yep. I can't remember exactly. The, Reichenbach uh, the Fall, cliff. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it was an actual cliffhanger. That's where the term comes from. Um, so, I mean, I love that sort of storytelling. Um, so, but I mean, it's also great to be able to write so you know all 100, 184 pages like Son of Hitler. Mm. Now, Anthony, yeah. I don't know if I, you recall, you, oh. but something we ask everybody that comes on the show, what are you currently geeking out over? What am I currently geeking out over? Okay, that's a tough one. Um, you know, we, we just mentioned, or we, uh, a few minutes ago, we talked about uh, the Daredevil Born Again, um, and I'm getting back into Frank Miller. Uh, I had read his stuff years ago, and now um, I'm actually putting together an idea for a Daredevil series, not for comics, but for something else. Um, and so I'm rereading some of the classics, so I forgot how great Frank Miller is in that Daredevil run. Just some of the best writing I've ever, I've ever encountered. Um, so geeking out on that, um, my wife and I um, missed the whole Parks and Recreation phenomenon when it was first released as a television series. So we're we're binge watching all of it on Netflix right now. So I'm hugely geeking out on that. Um, and then I should probably come up with a third one right now. Um, let me see TV film film. I'm geeking right now. It's Oscar season. Oscar season is about to be. In, so I'm already geeking out on the films that are going to be coming out. So The First Man was just released, uh, had its uh, debut at the Venice Film Festival, the Damien Chazelle, Ryan Gosling movie. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I'm super excited about that. The reviews seem to be raves at the moment. So I'm already geeking out on the ability to watch that. Uh, Alfonso Cuaron's Roma, which will be a Netflix release in December. That one debuts tomorrow. Uh, I'm a huge film geek. Mm. Um, and not only that, but this, this is how much of film geek I am. <laughs> so myself and some friends, um, we have something called movie league, which is sort of like fantasy sports, but for, for movies. Um, and so every year we always have a draft and we pick, you know, 10 films that are going to come out over the span of the calendar year and you get points, uh, depending on how well it does at the box office. So you get one point for every million dollars it makes at the demand box office uh, and then you get a certain number of points to, um, um, based on how many nominations or awards it gets so you know, Golden Globe or Oscar nomination you get uh, gets 10 and Golden Globe or Oscar victory gets 20 that sort of thing so um, that's how hardcore geek I am so I know about every single film that's that's gonna, that has come out in 2018 or will come out over the next four months um, and so I'm excited because now is when the real money comes in uh, and I finished I finished in the money the last three seasons and so I want to make an even four this year so whoever picked Black Panther basically wins yeah what how did we joke about that Black Panther was the equivalent of uh, drafting and getting I think LeBron James in the first round <laughs> um, so yeah so I unfortunately had the eighth pick in the first round I was last so I did not get Black Panther. So Black Panther already has 700 points for uh, domestic box office. Then it'll get a whack of nominations. So, yes, it's you basically the superpower team if you have Black Panther. Damn that Darcy. <laughs> the uh, I, so I have to ask, what are your? Because we're we're a horror minded horror minded bunch here. Um, the um, what do you think is going to perform better? New Predator, New Halloween, or New Suspiria? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm not. I don't think the okay. I don't know if a predator will predator will do very well at the box office. Um, I mean, Shane Black is an amazing screenwriter, uh, and he's proved his directorial chops. I just don't know if the buzz is there, and I've heard they've had to do a lot of reshoots. Uh, I think they had to completely redo the third act. So that always makes me scared. Uh, Halloween is getting a lot of good buzz. Uh, 
in terms of script and with Jamie Lee Curtis coming back. So I think that will do well. Suspiria, um, Suspiria will play like an art, an art film. So, I mean, I think it'll have a lot of fans, but I don't think it'll do phenomenally well. So out of those three, I'd say Halloween is probably your best bet in terms of box office and in terms of awards probably i mean i might come away with a critics choice nomination or two so uh out of those three i'd go halloween cool yeah nice <laughs> um yeah you know i had heard that with the, in the case of predator they uh, basically they reshot the entire third act because originally they had filmed it during the day and the filmmakers were like it's not scary during the action isn't as interesting mm-hmm. during the day do it all at night so they refilmed the ending at night <laughs> I that's that would be interesting if that was the case because again Shane Black is a smart guy he's yeah. the writer director of Predator and he's just he knows filmmaking so it would be odd that oh yeah oh shoot we should have filmed it at night you would think that he would know that but I'm not sure I'm always wary well I mean a lot of films especially Hollywood films have reshoots so it doesn't always scare me but it seems though the buzz coming out of that one is not positive is not that great but again. I'm not an insider. I don't know anything. I might be totally wrong. And the next thing you know, it's making $250 million at the box office. Who knows? Yeah, I had heard that uh, Shane Black joked that they were like, well, we got the third act in daylight and we got the third act at night. Why don't we just release like on the Blu-ray like two versions where you can watch it in daylight and nighttime? <laughs> the studio was like, no, that's that's not going to happen. Do it. He's do like, it. No. Do it clue style, and depending on which theater you go to, <laughs> yeah, you get the daylight or the yeah. nighttime. There's your there's, mo- tru- there's your, your adventure. adventure. Yeah. yeah, there it is. Follow Thomas there Jane <laughs> into daylight or darkness. <laughs> I wish they Thomas would do Shane that. Anywhere. I mean, let's let's face it. I mean, when you have to do reshoots because there's a lot of stuff that just didn't didn't gel or didn't work out, why not release that? Like, I mean, mm-hmm. to me, that's that that would that that would be an amazing film education i mean for i mean some of some of the most enjoyable film um going experiences i've had are with bad movies because you know i can always learn something about about what not to do so i mean i think i mean and i'm sure if shane black would be the first person to say yeah like let's let's throw it on let's throw in a blu-ray or um you know i mean and that's actually a question i have for you guys i mean because i'm sure you have more exposure to this than me but do you feel like with the uh, with the rise of streaming networks and everything like that, that we're going to be missing out on all these special uh, features like director's commentaries, you know, outtakes, you know, like that sort of stuff. Like, do you feel like that? Do you feel like that's happening? Because that's what that's the vibe that I'm getting. I See, mean, because I don't. I used to love renting or buying Blu-rays just because they had all the special features, and that was my education. You know, I'm a, I'm a I'm a uh, voodoo nut. Like I get all my movies I get through voodoo and I'm also the kind of like wacko that actually watches like literally every single special feature, like all the featurettes, like even the stuff that I don't like necessarily like care about. Like, Hey, this is like what this looks like. Like, look at this gag reel. And it's like, well, they're never that funny, but okay. And, um, the cool thing is like, they're starting to reintegrate special features again, like for infinity war. You get the director's commentary, you get all the deleted scenes, you get all these like little like five minute, five to 20 minute featurettes. So I think it's there. It's just, it's an almost like a niche within a niche these days though. Yeah. What's, um, and sorry, I'm, I'm turning the tables on you guys. Um, since you are a nut for special features, what's your favorite director's commentary? Ooh, I'll tell you one th- <laughs> the, one of the nerdiest, I love that question. One of the nerdiest things I've ever done was um the double disc boogie nights that came out on dvd a while back i watched the movie and then i watched the commentary with paul thomas anderson and cast which he just filmed like so like it cuts around so you have like drunk mark Wahlberg, (laughs) like you can literally hear like glass like the like beer glasses in the background he's like i gotta go paul i gotta go he's like no 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 what, this scene's coming up and so like it's really great you get to hear all the different stuff and then i lit, watched it for a third time in a row and it was just paul thomas anderson, anderson commentary he's great but i think like the film school of commentary that i've just love listening to hearing this guy talk because he actually asked you questions which is funny because he you know you're like what the fuck is um <laughs> ridley scott for the first alien movie is like fascinating. Uh, yeah. And um, one more real quick, just because it was the last one I watched, Dance was, uh, well, De- Dance of the Wolves is great because Kevin Costner's like, I'm enjoying watching this film with you guys. And I'm like, me too, <laughs> Kevin Costner. Um, 
But I really liked, I watched Oliver Stone's commentary for Platoon, and that was really, really crazy because he gave a lot of insight to his own experience in Vietnam, the characters, inspirations, and then the movie itself. So that was a really cool, like, multi-layered commentary. Oh, that's cool. Uh, personally, for me, uh, one of my favorite, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a specific one uh, that, that is, like, my favorite, but I love watching Robert Rodriguez movies with commentary because he is all about like, Hey, anyone can be a filmmaker. Let me tell you how I did everything, you know, in all of these scenes. Like, and it's, it's like literally like, uh, you know, having a, a, a lecture on how he made this film, you know? So it's like you're, you're in film school and he's like, yeah, you know, I shot this, this way. And you know, we did all these little tricks and then, you know, going back with what you were saying earlier with like the bonus features, he also jams packs, you know, or jam- he takes his DVDs and packs them so tight with all kinds of like, you know, five minute film school for how to shoot like this and how to do that. Uh, it's wonderful. Uh, and then also the, uh, the, the commentary for the TV show Invader Zim. Mm. is hilarious <laughs> nice. because all those all those actors and uh, and 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 Jonan Vasquez and and everyone that was involved are such like a tight little family that they are just fucking you know they're they're just constantly making each other laugh and stuff it was so fun to listen to the commentary that they did for me it's the uh it's the uh, john carpenter commentaries mm. um it's you know listening to him and kurt russell that's the best duo do, uh, yeah big, big trouble in little china they do uh escape from new york in which case like they point uh, kurt russell points out his ex-wife about to get killed in that film her character um and the thing commentary the thing commentary is great the commentary he does with rowdy roddy piper may he rest in peace yes for they live um and the john carpenter jamie lee curtis commentary yeah for uh the first halloween all all good stuff all good like if we're talking like he's a, just an interesting dude and it's it's a, it's very insightful too it's you know if we're talking the f- kind of film school quality to totally. it all yeah there's uh there's always something special with a John Carpenter joint. See, I miss I miss all these I miss all the director's commentaries. It feels yeah. like it's been years since I've uh, listened to any of them because most of the most of the films I consume now are on uh, on on streaming devices. So, uh, I mean, just one, one final thing, just with Robert Rodriguez. Yes, I can definitely see that because whenever people ask me to recommend books for filmmaking, um, Rebel Without a Crew is always the top of my list because I remember reading that years ago. And it's so inspirational. And he breaks it down. It's like, anyone can do this. This is how it's done. Go out and do it. Yeah. Um, and so it does not surprise me that the director's commentary uh, would be one of the best. Yeah. It's basically like reading that book, but custom tailored for each movie. <laughs> That's awesome. Although I, do, I would love to hear Mark Wahlberg in the background. Come on, Pa. I need Was, to go. I, I swear to God, like the beginning, because it's a long movie. It, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, the movie's almost three hours long. And I swear, the beginning of the movie, he's already drunk. He's like, he's like, I gotta go, <laughs> and he's like, no, 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 one more scene. And you can tell like they they chopped it up because then like clearly there's like different audio, and he's with, uh, you know, Burt Reynolds isn't in it, but like uh, you know, Philip like Don Seymour Cheadle, Hoffman. I think you know they get, like they're all spread out all over the place. And Seymour Hoffman, but the uh, the the uh, the Mark Wahlberg stuff's the funniest because yeah, he gets progressively drunker and he's trying to catch a flight. Um, <laughs> and yeah, especially when they get to like the fake dick at the end. He's like, yeah, yeah, I got somewhere in my drawer somewhere. I right, get the fuck out of here. I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> but I, he, Paul Thomas Anderson is somebody I wish still did commentary. Like he stopped doing commentary for his movies. He's like, I don't want to yeah. do these anymore. And I get it, but like I was bummed out because he was a guy that like he did an amazing like production diary for Magnolia, that was really really cool. Talking about like you know speaking of like filmmaking and stuff. Like he was somebody I loved hearing his commentaries. Um, definitely one of my favorites. Yeah. Oh yeah, because because he loved he loved the craft, and I remember that like that Boogie Nights um, uh, director's commentary is actually that's actually my favorite. Nice. Um, and yeah, just he was so great. And then I think he's just sort of well, now I'm P.T. Anderson, and I don't need to talk about what I'm doing, and I'll leave it to the critics to interpret it. So, yeah. but yeah, those those first few films and those first few commentaries were amazing. Anyway, as I as I stare wistfully <laughs> off into the distance, like, I need to watch a good commentary tonight. Yeah, watch that's what I'll do. Tonight. Yeah, yeah so. But um, Anthony, before we uh, return you to the uh, to the wilds of New York, any any um, you know thing you want to tease about Luke Cage, Everyman, or any other projects you got in the pipeline? 
in terms of Luke Cage, Everyman, as I said, uh, second chapter, which are issues three and four, come out in mid-September. Uh, we've already alluded to it. Uh, one of um, uh, Luke's best friends will show up in uh, issue number three or in the next chapter. Uh, makes a really great appearance and plays a huge role moving forward in it. Uh, and in the next chapter, we find out who the uh, mysterious Everyman is. Uh, and it's going to be very it's something that's also very topical. Jason Todd. Um, <laughs> oh my God! There's there's the crossover. Love it. Uh, um, no, guys, nah. well, it's not well, how well would it do with the box office though? That's what I would like to know. Um, but no, so that that's a lot of fun. And then in terms of other projects, um, nothing I can announce right now. I am about to start work on my next two audio dramas, uh, following the success of my um, uh, Audible series last year, uh, Unheard: The Story of Anna Winslow, which hit number one. Uh, I'm about to embark on two new ones, so I'm in the early brainstorming process uh, for those, and uh, I think we want to start recording them by the end of the year. So it's going to be a busy few months. Cool. All right. Well, again, Luke Cage, Everyman, the first two issues, which is to say Chapter 1, is out on Comixology and uh, Marvel Unlimited now. Uh, keep an eye out for uh, you know for Chapter 2, collecting issues 3 and 4, and, of course, check out Son of Hitler, Kill Shakespeare, uh, you know, just a whole slew of of, of uh, Anthony Del Cole books and, and audio dramas. Thanks again for coming on the show, man. Thanks a lot. This was uh, a lot of fun. Hey, man, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> got to go though. I got a flight, man. Yeah, <laughs> got to get out of here, Paul. Paul, <laughs> Paul, oh, come on. How do you mother for me? <laughs> yeah. yeah. This has been another Geek Out production. If you enjoyed what you heard, hey, you know, we've got a special episode every Friday. Of course, there's the usual catching up show every Wednesday. And you get book club episodes just about every Tuesday these days. Thanks for listening.